In this video, I'm going to share everything that tried to kill me in the desert section of the Pacific Crest Trail. Let's go! Okay, maybe that's just a little bit dramatic. I was never actually in fear for my life when I was out on the trail. However, I have had some people ask me what kinds of dangers and risks did we see? And then also people may be planning their own hike on the PCT desert section. I thought maybe you might appreciate hearing some of the stuff that I ran into and how I dealt with it. I recently heard a pretty good quote from a friend of ours named Synergy that we hiked with for a while on the PCT this year. And it goes a little bit something like this. When you're out here, Mother Nature is gonna to try to kill you. It's nothing personal. And I like that quote because it's so true that you're in a constant battle with nature when you're out on the trail. And it's not that nature doesn't like you or has anything against you personally, but nature also doesn't care whether or not you survive. Your survival is up to you. Many of the things I'm gonna talk about in this video are not particularly life-threatening, but they can be dangerous if you're not prepared. Also, this is not intended to be an exhaustive list of all of the things you could run into on the trail. So let's get started. The first item on the list is bees. Now there are areas on the PCT desert section where there aren't a whole lot of bees, but there are some areas where there are bees absolutely everywhere. Most of the bees that we saw were honeybees. I'm not sure whether they were the Africanized variety, but they were some variety of honeybee. For the most part, the bees will leave you alone as long as you just let them do their job. However, there is one exception, and that is if you get near a hive. There are certain bees that are members of the colony whose sole job is to defend the hive. And if you get near it, they will attack you. We ran into this situation right outside of Warner Springs. There was a great looking tree with shade. Luckily, before Callan set his pack down, I said, let's go a little bit further up the trail. We did, but people behind us, we found out later, ended up getting stung. Several people did because there was a hive there and they went and sat down and the bees attacked. One of the ways you can avoid running into issue is by keeping an eye on gut hook because people do a pretty good job of describing where some of the bigger hives are in gut hook comments. So if you see a gut hook comment that said there's a huge hive under the rock wall in mile 385.1, when you get to that mile, you just keep an eye out for it and then you can try to walk around it or stay as safe as you can. One thing that I did when we were in areas where bees were swarming everywhere is I would tuck my sleeves into my sun gloves and tuck my pants into my socks. Now you might think that sounds a little bit extreme, but keep in mind I'm allergic to bees, so getting stung is not really an option when I'm out in the back country. And I couldn't talk about bugs in the desert if I didn't talk about ants. If there's one constant in the desert, it's ants. They are all over the place. They're just everywhere. And for the most part, they seemed like they were harmless, but there were some red ants that we saw. And I know of one person that got bit by red ants and apparently it's fairly painful. Now, what I did two times that caused a problem was I accidentally sat my pack down near an ant colony and didn't realize it when I was taking a break. And both times it was absolutely covered with ants. Like within a minute or two, there were hundreds of ants crawling all over my pack and I had to pick it up and throw it off to the side and then try to brush them all off with my hat. So I quickly learned that the smart thing to do is before you sit down, check to make sure there's no ant hills around. And if you see those big lines, like a few inches wide of hundreds of ants marching along the trail, avoid those spots too. One thing that people ran into was when they were cowboy camping, they didn't want to be by ant areas there either. And folks like bees did a nice job of describing Ed Gunhook where there were spots where there were a lot of red ants. Next, let's talk about rattlesnakes. If you're doing any amount of hiking on the PCT in the desert, you're more than likely gonna run into a rattlesnake here and there. And I don't think there's any reason to panic. In my opinion, as long as you give them their space and let them do their thing, they are not gonna bother you. Obviously, you wanna respect the rattlesnake and not get near it, but it'll rattle if you get too close and let you know. We did talk to a snake expert one time that told us that the majority of rattlesnake bites occur on the hand in young males and alcohol is a factor. So you can just do the math on that one and figure out what's going on. One of the ways I try to avoid running into any problems with snakes is that I always look underneath any logs or rocks that I'm gonna take a seat on. I also don't stick my hand in any dark crevices and I keep an eye out where I'm walking when I'm on trail or you know going to the bathroom or something like that. You just wanna keep an eye where you're stepping to make sure you don't accidentally step on one of these guys. But if you do see one, just take a minute and enjoy the beauty of seeing one of these creatures in its natural habitat. I wanna talk about mice for a second as well. Although these are nothing like the notorious shelter mice on the Appalachian Trail, there are a couple of areas where there are mice that might try to get into your stuff. 
So what I did one time is I saw a bunch of mouse holes around my tent and I just set up there anyways, but that was kind of a mistake because all night long I could hear them running around outside my tent and it was a little bit annoying. Now mice aren't particularly dangerous, but they can get into your stuff. I didn't have a problem, but I did read some comments from other people where mice chewed holes in their tent to get into their food. So if you see the mouse holes, try to move on and find a different spot. So that's enough about animals. Let's talk a little bit about some of the plants that you might run into out there. The first one is the yucca plant, which in my opinion is a complete menace to hikers. The leaves on these things are razor sharp and can cut right through your pants or cut your skin if you brush up against one. The points on them are also razor sharp and they'll poke you in an instant if you even get near it. Now, the thing is with these yucca plants is they have some toxins on the end of them. At least that's what I read online because I poked my elbow a couple of different times and each time I would get a little mosquito bite thing that would last about two or three days. Also, the worst time was when I stepped backward into one and it went like a half inch into my leg. That was very painful. It kind of felt like I had a muscle tear in my calf and it lasted, the swelling lasted for like two weeks. So these things can be a little bit of a pain if you get poked. The best thing I tried to do was just keep an eye out for them and avoid them, but like I said, even though I was doing my best, I was still getting poked from time to time. Next, let's talk about poison oak. So poison oak, you definitely don't wanna get this on your skin because it can cause some really nasty rashes. And although we didn't see poison oak all that often, there were some sections where it was completely unavoidable and you had to wear pants because it was overgrowing the trail. Luckily, a lot of these sections were marked pretty well in gut hook, so they would say, hey, watch out for the poison oak coming up ahead. The main thing to do is be able to identify poison oak before you go out there so you know it when you see it. Because there are some sections where it was so close to the trail that you really have to take uh, evasive action to avoid rubbing up against it. Let's not forget about poodle dog bush. This stuff is allegedly even worse than poison oak if you get it on your skin. Luckily, I never ran into anybody who touched it and got any of the rash from it, but from what I've read online, it can be quite bad. Poodle dog bush is pretty easy to identify and can range in size from less than a foot tall to some of those bushes were even taller than me. And it also has a unique smell, a little bit pungent, skunky-like. The main thing with poodle dog bush is just to walk around it when you see it. Most of the time when you see poodle dog bush, it'll be in an area that was recently burned. So if you get into a burn area, that's when you know to look out for that stuff. Let's move on to some of the more environmental risks that are out there. One of them is wind. And during the day, wind is just a little bit annoying, but at night it can really cause some issues when you're trying to sleep. Now I'm used to an area where it's calm in the morning, gets a little breezy during the day, and then it gets calm at night again. But that is not always the case in the PCT desert. The worst night of wind that we had, it was perfectly calm when we went to bed, and it was perfectly calm when we woke up in the morning, but all night long it was just throwing our tents and thrashing our tents all over the place and it was hard to sleep and I can't believe my tent even survived that night. So the main thing to do here is just look for a spot where you're a little bit sheltered and keep an eye on the gut hook comments because they do a great job of indicating whether this is in a wind tunnel or it's an area that is sheltered and will be a little bit safer for you to camp. Another environmental thing is snow and when people think about snow on the PCT, the first thing that comes to mind is hiking in the Sierra. However, for us, we saw snow just before Mount Laguna, which was about 40 miles into the hike. In addition, when we got above seven or 8,000 feet, there were some areas like on San Jacinto, for example, where there was quite a bit of snow. And this was a year where it had melted off quite a bit and it wasn't that bad to walk on, but it was very obvious that in a bad snow year, it would be quite treacherous to walk through some of that stuff. So my approach was to use micro spikes and that gives you better grip, especially in the morning. So if I knew that I was gonna be walking through snow, I would prefer to camp before the snow and walk across that first thing in the morning when it's nice and crisp on top. It gets slushy in the afternoon when the sun's been on it for a while and you start post holing and sliding around a lot and your feet get a lot more wet. So that was one approach that I took. And if it was a higher snow year, I wouldn't even hesitate myself to take an ice axe, especially on an area like Mount San Jacinto. A great way to stay in tune with the conditions around Mount San Jacinto in particular is through the San Jack John snow report. This guy goes up there all the time and he films himself walking around and he'll show you what it's like on various sections of the PCT in the San Jacinto area. So keep an eye on that one and that'll let you know, do I need ice spikes? Do I need an ax? Should I take the reroute and avoid it altogether? That's a great resource to use. The last environmental thing I'll mention is the heat. 
Now I've gone into this in some of my other videos, so I won't go into too much detail here, but in summary, what I did was I had plenty of water, I increased my intake of electrolytes, and I spread my hiking out to different parts of the day. So not hiking fewer hours in the day, but just hiking at different times. For example, if I normally would be an eight hour a day hiker, rather than hiking from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., I might hike from 6 a.m to 11 a.m. and then from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. So just hiking the same eight hours, that, but at different parts of the day, so I'm not hiking in the hottest part of it. So there you have it. That is the list of potential dangers I saw while out in the desert section of the Pacific Crest Trail. There are plenty of ways that Mother Nature is going to challenge you, but hopefully you've gained some value out of me sharing the ways that I tried to mitigate some of those risks. As I said earlier, I couldn't possibly mention every single risk that's out there on the PCT, but if you've got some ideas you'd like to share with the backpacking community, please put something in the comments. I'm sure your fellow hikers will appreciate it. As always, if you found any value in this video, please hit that like button and consider subscribing to my channel. Thanks, and we'll see you out on the trail.